All right, so in our introduction to molecular orbital theory here, uh, we've got to talk about where bonds come from. So in molecular orbital theory says that bonds are created when orbitals on adjacent atoms overlap. So let's say we look at our orbitals here. We got the S and the P and the D. And so say these two green sphere down here, they represent uh, 1S orbitals of hydrogen. So as those hydrogen atoms approach each other, parts of those orbitals are going to overlap. So and what results from those overlapping orbitals is what we need to discuss here as far as uh, creating bonds in molecular orbital theory. So before we dive too deep, so our orbitals are all described with these lovely shapes. So spherical for S orbitals, dumbbell shape for P orbitals, and most of these are four leaf clovers for the D orbitals. So and those shapes are actually three dimensional mathematical equations we call wave functions. So and in this case, before we go too crazy into what those wave functions are, uh, let's talk about something you're probably well familiar with already, and that's your two dimensional wave functions. So like your typical sine function right here. So your sine function takes on positive values from zero to pi and negative values from pi to two pi. And right at pi, it has a value of zero. So in any multiple of pi thereof, and we call that point where the function, a wave function takes on a value of zero, a node. That'll be important later. So it turns out when you've got these two lovely functions, uh, in this case, two sine functions, if they overlap, where crest matches crest and trough matches trough, all of their values will be additive. And we say that they are in phase. So when two wave functions are in phase, they add together, resulting in what we call constructive overlap. So we end up with a, a sine function here that has double the amplitude. So this would technically be two sine of x or two sine theta, however you want to look at it. Cool. You can also do them exactly out of phase where crest overlaps with trough, so and trough with crest. So and you get absolutely zilch. There's no wave function there whatsoever. So they have completely canceled each other out. And so when they're out of phase, so you get destructive interference. And it turns out we're looking at the extremes here. Uh, it turns out anything in between can happen as well. So but the extremes are the ones that are most useful for the discussion at hand. So when these two lovely s orbitals over here overlap here, then the question is, what happens? Constructive overlap or destructive overlap? And it turns out it's a bad question because it's not really or, it's and. Now let's take a look here. So it turns out both result here. So the convention I'm going to use here is that uh, I'm using two different colors, green and blue. One represents positive, one represents negative. Turns out your s orbital so it can be either positive or negative, but it's either all positive or all negative for the 1s orbital. And so here, this would represent constructive overlap happening, two in-phase wave functions. The part that are, parts that are overlapping both have the same sign. So whereas this one represents destructive overlap, uh, they're exactly out of phase, and the parts that are overlapping, one's blue, one's green, are exactly, uh, have opposite signs, are exactly out of phase. And so in the first case, uh, with constructive overlap, where they're in phase, you end up creating a larger molecular orbital, we say. So and in this case, we get the end-to-end -end overlap of two orbitals. We call that a sigma bond. And so we call this the sigma 1s bonding molecular orbital. So if you look, the best place for an electron to be would be right in between the two nuclei. It's attracted to both. It lowers its potential energy when you let it be closest to what it's attracted to. And so it turns out this lowers the energy. This molecular orbital is lower in energy than either of the individual 1s orbitals. On the other hand, though, when destructive overlap occurs, so that same region right between the two nuclei is actually where a node is created. Destructive overlap occurred. And so the best place for an electron to be right there, there is no orbital density there at all. That's the one place where an electron is totally not allowed to be. And so it turns out this has shifted to higher energy. Turns out that the energy of an electron in orbital is also related to the volume it can occupy. And with this overall having an overall smaller volume, that's another reason why it's also shifted to higher energy. And we call this an anti-bonding molecular orbital. When you put electrons in a bonding molecular orbital, those electrons are lower energy than when they were just individual atoms. And so it tends to bring those atoms together. It lowers the overall energy of the electrons. We call them bonding. Whereas if you put electrons in an anti-bonding orbital, those are higher energy than the individual atomic orbitals. And as a result, those would actually serve, they'd rather not be there, and it serves to pull the atoms apart, the nuclei apart, if you will. So if we take a look at hydrogen here, specifically, this is what's going on. So hydrogen, each hydrogen atom, you know, let's do that in a different color. Each hydrogen atom has a single electron. 
in their 1s atomic orbitals. So when those orbitals come and overlap and these molecular orbitals are created, those atomic 1s orbitals no longer exist. What's confusing about these molecular orbital diagrams is that we put two points in time on the same diagram. We put the atomic orbitals across the horizontal axis here. So, and before the atoms are bonded together, that's what exists. But after those two atoms come together and the orbitals overlap, those atomic orbitals no longer exist. And these molecular orbitals put on the vertical axis are what actually exist. So and we'll see why H2 hydrogen exists as a diatomic. So before, we can see the energy of these two electrons in the 1s orbitals. But after those two 1s orbitals overlap, creating these two bonding and, molecular, um, sorry, bonding and antibonding molecular orbitals, we'll see that both electrons will end up in the bonding molecular orbital. And the overall energy of our electrons is lower after we've bonded together than when there were two individual hydrogen atoms. And that's why H2 exists. So it turns out we define something called bond order here. So in bond order, you just simply take the bonding electrons minus the antibonding electrons and divide by two. And it's kind of analogous to how many bonds you'd have. So like a single bond would be a bond order of one, a double bond, a bond order of two, so on and so forth. So in this case, we've got two bonding electrons. We've got zero in the antibonding orbital, so two minus zero, all divided by two, and we'd get a bond order of one here for hydrogen. Cool, that's analogous to a single bond, and if we looked at the Lewis structure for hydrogen, it looks like a single bond, so it totally correlates uh, with Lewis dot structure theory here in this one regard. Now, if we looked, helium does not exist as a diatomic, so, and we can show why it does not exist as a diatomic here with this same molecular orbital theory. So helium, on the other hand, has two valence electrons. So with four total then for our molecular uh, orbital diagram, we'd have to fill in two more electrons here in the sigma 1s star from uh, this molecular diatomic helium. And we'd see we've got two electrons in the bonding, but two in the antibonding. And if we calculate the bond order, we'd have two minus two, which is zero, divided by two, would get us an overall bond order here for He2 of zero, essentially meaning there's no bonds, i.e. it doesn't exist. If you have at least any sort of positive bond order, that species has a chance of existing, but a bond order of zero is not going to exist. And this is why helium doesn't you know, exist as a diatomic. It turns out the overall energy of its electrons is not lowered. It actually have the same average energy as the original 1s orbitals. So, but on the other hand, you're as reactive as your highest energy electrons. And diatomic helium would actually have more reactive electrons if it exists as a diatomic. So thus explaining why helium just prefers to say as two individual atoms having their electrons in the 1s orbitals. Okay, we can also make this a little more complicated. So we're going to get into a discussion talking about the period two elements. So and to talk about those, we got to now deal with also the p orbitals. Now p orbitals, you got three of them, px, py, pz, and they just differ on which axes they exist on, the x, y, or z axes. So, and when two atoms come together, they have a chance of their p orbitals overlapping in a side-to-side -side fashion. Now, it turns out if you look at a typical p orbital here, so your p orbital has one side positive and one side negative. And again, blue, green, whichever one's positive or negative is irrelevant, it's just you can see their opposite sides. And then you can see right at the nucleus here, the wave function takes on a value of zero, and that's a node. The p orbital always has a node at the nucleus. So. When two p orbitals come together in this kind of end-to-end -end fashion, we call that again sigma overlap. So in this sigma overlap, we can see that right where they're overlapping, we should get constructive interference that are in phase. So, and it creates a larger molecular orbital here. And because due to sigma overlap, we'd call that the sigma 2p bonding molecular orbital. Now on the other hand, when destructive overlap occurs instead, so right where they overlap, they're exactly out of phase. So, and destructive interference occurs, and it creates a node right in the middle of the molecular orbital. And so this molecular orbital is higher energy, So, and we call it the antibonding sigma 2p. So this little asterisk always signifies antibonding. Cool, now it's only, you're only going to have one p orbital actually oriented, uh, pointing towards each other when two atoms come together. The others, if they're going to overlap, are going to have to overlap in a side-to-side -side fashion like we see here, and we call that pi overlap. So when pi overlap happens, again, it can happen in phase, as it does here in this lower set, or exactly out of phase. So when they're in phase, you lead to constructive overlap, and again, you create this giant molecular orbital, so that we call pi 2p here. 
However, when the destructive inter overlap occurs again, so right where they overlapped, right down the middle of our diagram, creates another node. So, and this is again higher energy, and that's the antibonding here, sigma 2p star. All right, so here we're going to take a look at the molecular orbital diagrams for the diatomic species for the uh, elements in period number two. So if we look here, so the 2s orbitals come to overlap, and when they do, they simultaneously create a lower energy bonding sigma 2s and a higher energy antibonding sigma 2s star. So that star always signifies the antibonding again. So, but when the p orbitals come to overlap, there's three for each of the two atoms. So, and only one of them is actually going to point end to end towards each other in this case. And when they do, it creates a sigma 2p and a sigma 2p star for the antibonding. But the other two are going to have to overlap in that side to side fashion, pi fashion, we say. So, creating two lower energy pi bonding, uh, pi 2p bonding molecular orbitals, and two higher energy pi 2p star antibonding molecular orbitals. Cool. So it turns out this is what the diagram looks like. It's nice and symmetrical here for O2, Fe2, I'm sorry, O2, F2, and Ne2. So, but it turns out the MO diagram for B2, C2, and N2 would look just a little bit different. So it turns out the interaction between the 2s and the 2p is a little bit stronger over here. So, and the result is that the 2s orbitals drop down in energy a little bit, and the 2p sigma here goes up a little higher. So much so that the sigma 2p is actually now higher in energy than the pi 2p, and that's your big difference here as compared to how we see the diagram for O2, F2, and Ne2. And so that's gonna change how we fill in the electrons just a little bit. So, but I wanna sit here and take a look at both B2, C2, and N2, and see some differences between the three here. So if we look, we're only looking at the valence electrons. Technically, you can include the 1s electrons on this as well, and then I would have to include all the electrons, not just the valence. So, but I'm gonna focus only on the valence here. So in this case, boron's got three valence electrons, so B2 would have six valence electrons. So technically, we could fill in six electrons, three on each of the atomic pictures, but I'm gonna focus exclusively just on the MO diagram, the molecular orbital diagram down the middle. So with those molecular orbitals, I've gotta fill in six electrons for B2, and so first two go there, next two go there, and here I come across two equal energy or degenerate orbitals, and so they each get one. So if we were gonna calculate the bond order here, we'd add up all the bonding electrons, two and three, four, subtract off the antibonding here in the sigma 2s star, so four minus two is two, and then divide by two. And we'd find out that the bond order for B2 is one. And that's analogous to B2 being held together by a single bond. What we'd also find out here though is that B2 would have two unpaired electrons. So when it turns out when a species has unpaired electrons, it gives it a property we call paramagnetism. And we'd say that B2 is paramagnetic. Now it turns out what that ultimately means is that as it moves through a magnetic field, it would be attracted to the magnetic field. So the converse of that is when an atom has all of its electrons paired, we say it is diamagnetic and it'll experience a very slight repulsion as it moves through a magnetic field. Cool, but we could say that B2 has a bond order of one and that it's paramagnetic. Now if we move on to C2, C2 has four valence electrons per atom, so that'd be a total of eight in the diatomic carbon here. So we have to fill in two more electrons here. So, and now we could calculate the bond order for C2. And in this case, two bonding there, four, six bonding total, and then two antibonding. So six minus two is four, divide that by two, and we get a bond order of two. And that's analogous to C2 being held together by a double bond. We also see now that all of C2's electrons are paired up. And so this species would be diamagnetic, as we just kind of mentioned. Cool, moving on to N2. So N2, nitrogen's got five valence electrons, so N2 would have a total of 10 valence electrons to fill into the MO diagram. So we'd have to add yet two more. So if we calculate the bond order, we've got two, four, six, eight bonding electrons, minus two antibonding is six, divided by two gets me a bond order of three. So with a bond order of three, that's analogous to a triple bond. And what we know what molecular nitrogen, N2 diatomic nitrogen looks like, and it has a triple bond. And so molecular orbital theory is consistent with what we know from Lewis dot structure theory here as well. We also see that all the electrons are paired up, so N2 would also be diamagnetic here as well. Cool, let's see how this plays out for O2, F2, and Ne2 on this slightly different diagram as well. Cool, 
cool. Now we know what O2 and F2 look like as well, so we'll be able to correspond uh, uh, how the MO theory corresponds with Lewis dot structure theory in their case as well. Uh, oxygen's got six valence electrons, so O2 is going to have 12 valence electrons to fill into the MO diagram. So in this case, there's your first two, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and again, degenerate orbitals each get one. Cool. And in this case, if we calculate a bond order, we've got two, four, six, eight bonding, and then two, three, four, antibonding. Eight minus four is four divided by two gets us a bond order of two. And if we look at molecular oxygen, the Lewis structure, we see that it is indeed held together by a double bond. So again, that bond order is corresponding to the double bond here. What we don't see in Lewis theory, though, is it looks like we have these unpaired electrons, I'm sorry, we have these uh, unshared electrons, these non-bonding electrons, but they're all in pairs. And so because they all look paired up in the Lewis theory, we might have been surprised to learn that O2 is paramagnetic. But molecular orbital theory here explains something that Lewis dot structure theory does not. We see these two unpaired electrons here in the pi 2p star antibonding molecular orbitals, and O2 is indeed paramagnetic. So molecular orbital theory here actually does a better job describing reality than Lewis dot structure theory. This is one of the great successes of MO theory. If we move on to F2, so fluorine's got seven valence electrons. Uh, F2 diatomic fluorine would therefore have 14 electrons to fill in. We'd have to add two more. So and in this case, we now have added two more antibonding electrons. We've got two, four, six, eight bonding, two, four, six antibonding. And eight minus six is two divided by two gets me a bond order of one. So and the structure for F2 is indeed a single bond between the fluorines. Cool. So again, MO theory is corresponding with Lewis dot structure theories terms of bond order and number of bonds quite well. Now any two, you might be like, hey Chad, any two doesn't exist. He's not one of the seven diatomics. And you're exactly right. And molecular orbital theory, just like with HE2 not existing, is gonna explain why. So if we had two more electrons here, so each neon's got eight valence electrons for a grand total of 16 in the diatomic, fill them all in, and we find out that we've got two, four, six, eight bonding, two, four, six, eight antibonding, and we're gonna get a bond order of zero. Again, there's no bonds holding them together, and that's why, again, any two doesn't even exist. Cool, so this is, again, one of the great success of MO theory is that it explains some things that Lewis dot structure theory couldn't while still confirming other things uh, we already knew from Lewis dot structure theory.